Okay, yeah. Hi, hi everyone. I would like to first thank Judy for inviting me to give a presentation here. Uh, it's a real honor to spread our work and make a difference in the quantum community here. And I hope my talk today can give the audience some useful information um, that may inspire future work in this area. Uh, again, I'm Minjiao Liu, third year graduate student at UChicago and a visiting student at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, I work with Professor Liang Jiang and my advisor, Yuri Alexiv, who is a scientist at Argonne. Uh, on topics of quantum computing, quantum information theory, using numerical tools, and high-performance computing. Uh, the topic of this talk today uh, is about boson sampling. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard about quantum supremacy demonstrations from Google, and perhaps also ones from USTC and Xanadu. So these papers always quote some crazy number of years, like thousands or tens of thousands of years of classical simulation that is needed to simulate their experiments saying that their experiments can only be achieved using a quantum device. What is perhaps a little bit less discussed is that physicists, computer scientists, and mathematicians have since really improved their simulation techniques, and most of these supremacy claims have been significantly weakened. Uh, for example, the random circuit sampling experiments done by Google, which is essentially to run random quantum circuits and measure the output distributions, have been proven to be simulable in polynomial time. And this is telling us that random circuit sampling is not scalable, uh, uh, is not a scalable path to quantum supremacy. Uh, there are also papers that simulate uh, that simulated experiments of similar scales as the, as the Google experiments, and also challenged these uh, quantum supremacy claims. For boson sampling, though, um, similar classically efficient simulations have been discovered when the noise of the experiment is too high. So. What we really need to do as a field is to understand what makes an experiment truly quantum. Our works uh, examine this question through the use of high performance computing computational tools. Um, so first, let me introduce you to the concept of boson sampling, which is uh, to sample photons, because photons are bosons, that's why they're called boson sampling. Uh, before that, however, I need to first talk about optical interference. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of a canonical experiment you can do as a physics student. You can look at the most basic setup of an optical interferometer, which is basically a laser shining a light beam uh, to the beam splitter, which split, split a light into two paths. And then the beams bounce and recombine at the second beam splitter. So, for example, for path A, it'll pass through the beam splitter two, and then half of it will go to the right, half of it go to the top exit port. Similarly, for path B, half of it will go to the up port and half of it will be reflected to the uh, right port. The, so this, uh, this means that uh, you know, for the right port, roughly half of the light will come from path A and half of the light will come from path B. And the same goes for the top exit beam. Um, what is interesting about you know, optical interference is that we won't exactly expect 50-50% coming out of each path. To see this, we'll consider an equivalent setup on the left, which is basically the same thing. You know, you have a light source going through a beam splitter, like light source going through the beam splitter, split into two paths, like path A and path, path B here. But then they get reflected and recombine at the second beam splitter, which in this case is the same beam splitter. Half of it will, you know, be reflected to the photon detector. Uh, half of it will go through to the photon detector, and then the other half will go back to the light source, which you know just kind of gets thrown thrown away, disappears. So it's the exact same setup. Um, you can see that what I'm drawing out is is the waveform of the light, uh, and also what the waveform of the light coming back. And right now you can see that you know the two paths uh, that the, the the light matches. So basically saying that the top and the bottom of the waveforms uh, match. So they quote unquote, constructively interfere. Now this will result, if you add the two waves together, this results in a larger amplitude of oscillation of the light wave. So you detect more light on the end here. Um, but if I just move this mirror a little bit, so if, you know, if I just really focus on this mirror and kind of look at the position, if I, I started from here, but then I move it a little bit and then you pay attention to the position of the wave, it shifts with the mirror. No, that makes sense. But now with this shift, what I'm seeing is that the top and the bottom of the two waves coming from the left mirror and the top mirror stop no longer match. In fact, if you add them together, you get a flat, flat line. So it cancels out. So you basically see almost no light coming out of it. 
So this is this can be quite interesting, you know, because what you can do is to is effectively move this mirror. But you know, in reality, you don't have to use a mirror to do that. You can you can uh, you can add some kind of medium in the middle to delay the the light oscillation and things like that. So you can imagine if you have a bunch of lasers coming in and you have an array of beam splitters and then, you know, combine these lights and interfere. And then you try to measure the amplitude at the output ports, like, like here, you know, things can get quite complex, uh, you know, given that you can kind of randomly change these phases, the position of the mirror, the, the amount of delay in these waves, depending on your, 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 you know, device setup. But that in and of itself is not that interesting. Uh, because you know we can describe light as wave purely classically. There's nothing quantum mechanical about it. You know the classical picture of light described by waves, described by Maxwell Maxwell's equations, doesn't really require quantum mechanics. And also that wouldn't be called boson sampling because that's just you know an interferometer. So what is so bosonic about light? To understand that, we need to have a little bit of review of boson stat statistics. Let's say that I have a particle from uh, you know, particle A from the bottom of the beam splitter. So this is particle A, and then a particle B from the top of the beam splitter. There are four ways in which they could exit the beam splitter. So for example, A from the bottom passes through uh, to the top, and then B gets reflected to the top, or A uh, passes through to the top, and then B passes through to the bottom, or A gets reflected to the bottom, B reflects to the top, and or A reflects, and then B passes through. There are four ways in which they can exit. Now, you may notice that the second and the third look very similar, except that the outgoing photons will be coming from different source photons, right? Uh, but, you know, in, in, in fundamental physics, particles are indistinguishable. So that means that if you were to exchange two identical particles, the two photons, A and B, if you exchange them, you should have exactly the same quantum state. What I'm saying is that the nature doesn't care uh, about which photon is which one. So as long as one particle is going, is leaving up and then one photon is leaving down, you should end up with the same quantum state, the same quantum wave function. For bosons, if you exchange particle A and particle B, you know, you'll get the same wave function, but you also have a plus sign implicitly here. For fermions, you would have a negative sign, you know, and this negative sign doesn't really matter because, you know, if you were to calculate the probability amplitude of where you can find a particle, that negative sign just you know gets squared and you get the same thing. And, and bosons and fermions are two types of fundamental particles in nature. And then you know you have to obtain, you have to, for multi-particle wave functions, you have to either obey the boson particle rule or the fermion particle uh, wave function rule. Uh, there are also other particles, but we're not going to discuss that today. To be more explicit, we can start writing down our wave function. Let's say I put the exit state of particle A, which comes from the bottom, in the first position, and then use a zero to represent going to the top. Then this first state, and then, you know, the, the particle B, you know, would be in the second position, and then going out to the top would be zero, two. So, you know, the first one would be zero, zero, second one would be, you know, reflected one, zero, third one would be, uh, oh, sorry, one, zero, you know, one state is, you know, up, so this would be one, zero, this one will be one, uh, sorry, <laughs> This one goes to the bottom, so it's zero. So this one is zero, one, and then zero. Uh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> anyway, you can you can write it down. You know this makes sense. You can write down the wave function in the you know this formalism, and then what you also realize is that if you if you you can obtain a similarly valid wave function by exchanging two particles. You exchange the position of particle A and particle B. It shouldn't really matter. So you can do that, and then zero zero becomes zero zero, one zero becomes zero one, zero one becomes one zero, one one still is one one. And what you do here, you know, you have two valid wave functions, but in order to satisfy the boson uh, symmetry rule, you add them together. And you can check that if you add them together, and then you know you you do the particle exchange for the overall function, you get the same sign. You know, so you know if you if you were to exchange position one two for the whole thing you get, get itself back exactly the same thing without a sign difference. For fermions, you know, you, what you do with the two equally uh, valid types of wave function is you, you subtract them. And you can check now if you switch the positions, you'll get a negative sign here. So you know, by, by subtracting the second part of wave function from the first part, you will satisfy the fermionic rule. So we know photons are bosons, so the photons would obey this kind of wave function. 
And if you cancel out, you know, terms that are, you know, the same, but have different signs. So one zero cancels out with negative one zero and zero one cancels out with uh, zero one, you get zero zero minus one one. So this means that my photons will both exit the top or exit from the bottom. And there, the middle possibilities are not possible. So this is to say that photons will always bunch together. For fermion wave function, we can similarly do simplification. You know, you can see the plus sign of zero zero cancels out with the minus sign of zero zero, and one one cancels out with you know one one. So you get one zero and zero one. This is to say that the photons will only exit from different ports, and this is to say the photons, sorry, not the photons, the fermions cannot occupy the same quantum state. That is good uh, because this brings us back to the very familiar Pauli exclusion principle. We've heard about this many times. This is the fundamental reason why we have that. So with this level of added complexity of you know, the quantum nature of bosons and you know, the complex uh, structure of the interferometer, uh, we'll be able to understand why boson sampling it can, can be quite complex. And this is you know, more interesting. So now we officially move on to the experimental setup of boson sampling. We put n single photons into an array of beam splitters which is you know, the interferometer here. And we have M detectors at the end to try to count how many photons come out of each port. In order for the photon from the top port to go all the way to the bottom, you need to have at least M layers, right? So you can, each layer you propagate one down so you can uh, eventually propagate to the Mth detector. Um, so at any single detector, there can at most be N single photons because you, you put N single photons in, so at most you can count N. So that means the local Hilbert space has dimension n at each detector or you know each location on the beam splitter. So we also know that the way quantum states are transformed in, inter in the interferometer preserves the total photon number. So you're not going to magically add a photon or you know subtract a photon. So you're, you're constrained to work with certain kind of unitaries that preserve a certain kind of symmetry. So the fancy way of saying uh, that it preserves the number of photons is to say the whole thing has a global U1 symmetry. Now, what is Gaussian boson sampling? Because remember, my talk is not on single photon boson sampling, it's on Gaussian boson sampling. So what is Gaussian about it? So Gaussian's photon, Gaussian boson sampling is to simply replace the single photons with the Gaussian states, so-called the squeezed states. Now, what squeezed states mean are basically, you know, uh, these things can have more than one photon per mode, actually. Because in fact, each squeezed state is a superposition of zero photons, one photons, two photons, three photons, all the way up to infinitely many photons. It's an infinite superposition of various number of photons. Now, of course, the probability for you to have infinitely many photons is infinitely small. So, you know, you overall, you can have some kind of average photon number. The difficulty now for simulating Bose, Gaussian boson sampling is you know, because you have this tail end of distribution of how many photons your each mode can have, exactly representing the, the Hilbert space is impossible. You just have to truncate it somewhere. And in general, you know, your, your Hilbert space dimension have to be much larger than single photon uh, boson sampling simulations if you want to uh, obtain a desired a degree of accuracy. So now move on to, to simulation. You know, we want to know, okay, is it easy to simulate? Is it hard to simulate it classically? Uh, given that there is quite some level of complexity. So what we can do uh, is to, to, you know, naively, if we write down the quantum state of n photons, that would be simply impossible because the wave function will have to be exponentially large. Now, in order to classically simulate the quantum state, we use a technique called tensor network. Now, tensor networks are just efficient ways of representing a large many-body wave function with polynomial resources. And they're very nice, uh, you know, because they have this intuitive pictorial uh, graphical representation. So, for example, if you look at vector A, which, you know, you can understand as a dimension one tensor, if we want to enumerate all the elements for A, we need to say, okay, A1, A2, all the way through AN. So, for example, we will be looping all the AI elements along one axis. So, the vector slash, rank, uh, slash dimension one tensor A has one index. So graphically, we shall represent this as a blob with one bond coming out named I. So this represents that you have one index. Uh, similarly, you know, for a matrix or rank two or, or dimension two tensor uh, 
enumerating all the elements will require you to you know, count all two indices, you know, one for the row, one for the column. So graphically, we'll represent this as a blob, a blob B with two bonds coming out named I and J respectively to represent the bond, uh, to represent the indices uh, I and J. And similarly for 3D tensor, you will have three uh, you know, indices and you have three bonds coming out. And for the n-dimensional tensor, you will generally have n bonds coming out to representing n indices. Now, the more interesting part comes when you doing contraction over tensors. So for example, matrix multiplication is essentially uh, tensor contraction. We can write this in index notation. So say, you know, your F matrix is the matrix product between D and E and the I kth element of matrix F would be sum over all the J's of D, I, J, and E, J, K, right? So this is to say, so you, you have your summing, you, you know, in total, uh, the F tensor has two indices, two bonds, and then, you know, the D tensor has two bonds, I and J, the E tensor has bond J and K, but you have to sum all the J's, so it'll disappear, you know, it's a dummy index, it'll disappear if it's summed over, so the result wouldn't con contain that index. Graphically, you'll represent this by connecting the bond J coming out from D and bond J coming from E. So what remains open is just the in, uh, index I and index K. So graphically, you can represent sum of bonds or, or tensor contractions by connecting these open bonds of the tensors. So this is very nice because now we can draw out a, 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 you know, a large tensor graphically like this. What this is saying is that Oh, so what I'm here is representing is a, is a six dimensional tensor because I have six bonds left open. And then the mathematical expression is, you know, six individual tensors. And then each of them you know, between the neighboring tensors, for example, D and E, they share a bond, J. And then between these, E and F, for example, uh, E and, sorry, F is here, E and whatever, share uh, index K. So that would be the second bond. And then all of these bonds that are connected will be summed over. So this is a pictorial representation of a, a complex mathematical object. So this will give you a very nice one-dimensional way to, to represent the state. And then this is a little bit more exotic, but it's two-dimensional representation. Now, this is particularly important because it, you know, for one-dimensional systems, this actually turns out to be a very good way to represent one-dimensional many-body wave functions. Specifically, it's called the matrix product state. So we will be using exactly this formalism for uh, our boson sampling simulation. So, you know, going back to the physics of boson, boson sampling simulation, what the, the wave function I have to write down is, you know, basically for each position of the detector. Now, not only at the detector, but also in the middle, you can also equivalently say you have M positions. And then, you know, at these each positions, you can say how many photons are there. So what I'm here saying is that you would have m degrees of freedoms. So all the way from index indices from i to i1 to im, you have m positions, you have m degrees of freedom. Each position can have the possible values of how many photons there are. So I say, I'll be truncating to counting maximum in, at, at most d photons per, per position. So my wave function in general will be written as you know a superposition of all the basis states of having you know, whatever number of photons per uh, each mode and then an associated amplitude C I1 through I M. Now this amplitude would be, you know, because it has M I indices and each index can run D values, this would be a dimension M tensor. So I graphically represent this like this. And in this case, M equals to six because I have six bonds coming out. Now also each bond, each index can, takes on, can take on D values. So the total cost of storage of this tensor in classical machine memory would be d to the power of n. So imagine if you increase this to 100 modes, you know, 100 modes, then, you know, it's basically impossible to classically store it. So we need to do better in terms of uh, representing this uh, quantum state. So, you know, what we can do is to use the aforementioned uh, matrix product state, MPS, to do this. So the top bound, a bond can take on values similarly here, uh, uh, D uh, from, from value from, so, you know, you, you can look at it. Okay, it's still is, you know, six open indices. So in principle, it can represent a six dimensional tensor. Now, if you look at the cost, memory cost of a single tensor like this, you can say, okay, for a single one, 
the open indices obviously cannot occupy values from of d, uh, sorry, of zero to d minus one. What about the side bonds? So the side bonds can represent can can occupy values of zero all the way through chi minus one. Now I haven't really explained what chi is, but you would notice that these chi values are summed up. Uh, sorry, these these bonds are summed up. So you know they actually don't appear in the final answer. So it actually is up to us to decide what chi is. And I'll go back to it a little bit more detail later. But let's just assume that chi is not too large. So the cost of a single tensor is therefore d times chi squared. Uh, and you know, if you have a whole MPS, you'll be having m of these single tensors. The total memory complexity will be therefore m times d times chi squared. So it's nothing too crazy. You can see that we change the cost from exponentially m to linear m, which is a huge improvement. Now, obviously, we, we won't be able to represent arbitrary, you know, m-dimensional tensor with this kind of reduced total number of parameters. You know, you, you can magically uh, represent things. You know, so so, but but you know, what this tells us is that if you have limited bond dimension chi, if your chi is small, you'd be representing this state approximately, you know, because it has fewer parameters. So this gives you a tuning knob essentially. If you increase chi, you will have more parameters in the MPS in total. So be able to more accurately represent the overall uh, original perfect tensor. Now, in fact, if your chi is exponentially large in M, you will be able to represent it perfectly without any error. Mathematically, this object is written like this. You know, you can you can see that the individual tensors here are the are the gammas, and then you know we can ignore the lambdas for a second. But uh, what they do is just to rescale things, kind of. Um, Right, so all the dummy indices are the alphas and they're summed over. And then the I indices are the physical degrees of freedom. They re remain open, they're not summed over. So the MPS is also especially convenient for us to quantify the entanglement. Now that is very important because the whole point of our study is actually to see how hard it is to simulate it. Uh, and you know, entanglement is very important quantity because in general systems with higher entanglement is harder to simulate. And lower entanglement systems are easier to simulate. So quantifying the entanglement essentially tells us how easy or hard something is to be simulated. Now, if we split a many body wave function like this, for example, into two parts, namely we have subsystem A or sub subsystem B, for example, split, split it like this to the left and right, right side. What we can do is decompose the original wave function into this form by the so-called Schmidt decomposition, which is to say, that the original wave function is a superposition because of the sum superposition of tensor product states of uh, a wave function on subsystem A and a wave function on subsystem B. Now, a very clear example of this form is, you know, for example, the Bell uh, Bell state of uh, psi plus of phi plus. You know, this is you know an example where you know the subsystem A is in state A, uh, sorry, in state zero. Then subsystem B must be in state zero too. And if the subsystem A is in one, then B is also in one. So that's an example of this kind of way to write. And this is, you know, as we know, a maximally entangled state because, you know, you have a correlation between state zero and state one, right? Now, this is the Schmidt decomposition, you know, of a many body state is a generalization of this kind of quantum state where instead of only two states, two terms in the sum, you can have arbitrarily many up to, you know, a certain thing. And instead of the amplitudes being you know, evenly distributed, so for example, here is square root of two everywhere, your lambda values can actually change. So you could have many terms of varying different amplitudes. It will tell you something about the entanglement of the system. So you know, we know that if you want to, for example, have maximal entanglement in the Bell state, then both terms have to have exactly the same amplitude. You want to spread it out as evenly as possible. The extreme case of the other end of the spectrum is to say, you know, all of it is you know, it's amplitude one for the zero, zero state and zero for one, one state, then there's no entanglement. It's just purely a product state. So when the amplitudes are concentrated for one of the terms, you have less entanglement. But if the amplitude is evenly spread across different terms, you have more entanglement. Now this, you know, similarly applies here. So we have to capture the entanglement by looking at how evenly these lambda uh, alpha values are distributed. And the natural way for us to do that is to do the entanglement entropy. So if you're familiar with entropy, you know how you know, entropy measures chaos, which is essentially, you know, uh, you know, if your system is more evenly distributed in terms of probability to be in any kind of state, then you have higher entropy because it's more random. Uh, 
Now that gives you a nice measure of, uh, you know, the uniformity of a distribution. And, you know, here would be a good measure of uh, entanglement. Right. And what is convenient about MPS is that, you know, you split it into some A and B. It actually turns out one of the lambda values here, uh, which I'm omitting here, but the lambda value here would exactly correspond to the lambda value here in the Schmidt decomposition. So we can plug it right into this formula of entanglement entropy for us to be able to calculate the, the value. So if we have the MPS formalism, we have the MPS stored in our classical uh, computer memory, we'll be able to compute entanglement entropy right away. So this is very nice. Now for, you know, boson sampling, because of the U1 symmetry we discussed earlier, which is you know, to preserve the photon numbers, we can do a further level of reduction in the computational complexity. So remember how earlier by using the MPS, uh, we were able to you know, reduce the cost from exponentially M to linear. We can do a further level of reduction by realizing the fact that you know, if I have photon number preservation, I don't have to write down all the possible ways that one photon state can possibly become a two photon state because that's simply prohibited by photon. Uh, number conservation. How that works out, you know, I'm going to spare you with all the math, but it, it, it turns out that, you know, you can, you can avoid representing explicitly the physical degrees of freedom, the, the so-called I indices. You don't have to explicitly store, uh, you know, different, you know, gamma values for different I, which is, you know, how many photons there are. You don't have to store them for each number of photons. Uh, you can just get rid of it. Uh, but, you know, then what you have to pay for as a price is to introduce these so-called charge values. So what, what is a charge? A charge is to, it, the charge, for example, at site K, you know, is how many photons are to the right of the chain. Uh, so, so, you know, you can see here, if I, if I use the charge at site K minus one, subtracted by the number of charges at site K, that is to say this minus that, so this, again, is all the photons right of that. This is all the photons right of that. Then basically that gives me the number of photons here, right? So photons at site, uh, at this site, would be given by you know, the difference between the two neighboring charges. Now what the delta function does is to say that if the difference, so the charge I'm calculating using the difference between charges is exactly the, uh, the same as the would-be charge IK, then you know I I'll, I'll you know save the, I'll use this value to calculate the probability to calculate the things. So you know it's a little bit less intuitive how you will be able to do that, but the point is you can get rid of these physical uh, degrees of freedom and be able to to you know reduce the size of your tensor furthermore. Uh, right. And now for the simulation algorithm, uh, you know again you don't have to know too much about the details of the math, but what you have to do is to compute these large uh, contractions of tensors contracted over the, you know, the bonds, the alpha bonds, and also uh, the unitary matrices, you know, would have the input photon numbers, for example. So, you know, if you have a beam splitter, what you would be given is a unitary matrix telling you, okay, how many photons you have beginning, you know, at side K, how many photons you have beginning at side K plus one, and then apply the unitary matrix what will be the output number of photons at side K and what will be the number of output photons at K plus one. So that would be given by a unitary matrix. You have to kind of uh, do a matrix multiplication in a sense and then, and then do that. Uh, so our, the innovation of our uh, algorithm here is to be able to implement this complicated process in a GPU, which is a graphical processing unit to be able to parallelize things. So essentially what a CPU does is you know for the, each of these elements of you know so this one has four indices so what the cpu would try to do is essentially to loop all loop over all the individual elements of theta that you'll be trying to comp compute to do this kind of crazy sum and then move on to the next element of the theta matrix and try to do the sum so this will be very slow what the gpu trying to do is to do do it all at once uh, so we'll be able to achieve a significant speed up so for example for the simulation algorithm now, you can see the CPU implementation is overall, which is given by those triangle uh, mark points, markers, and the GPU is given by the uh, circular markers. We achieve roughly uh, a tenfold reduction or you know, on the order of 10, uh, tenfold reduction in, in, in the simulation time. 
And in fact, we can get more aggressive uh, savings in time because you can see the CPU benchmarks already getting to you know, 10,000 seconds. So it's kind of impossible for us to, to run it anymore. But you can see, you know, if we scale up the system size, uh, we'll be able to achieve more reduction. Yeah, so finally, we'll be able to answer the question that we've been long asking. Is it possible to simulate boson sampling efficiently? So to, to answer that question, we first need to, uh, sorry for the confusion in the slide, but we need to understand, okay, what is the thing that makes it possible to, to simulate? So if we go back to all the way to one of the earlier, earliest slides, uh, let's see, see the architecture of the boson sampling device, right? So it will have M layers, right? You have M modes, then that means you should have M layers. Each time you pass through a beam splitter, in principle, you will lose some photons because what a beam splitter is, it's introducing a new interface. And every time your photon runs through an interface, it has to experience some loss. So let's say that for each interface, I will have, you know, only be able to keep 99% of my photons. Then how many, what's the percentage of photons you'll be able to keep at the end of M layers? That'll be 0 0.99 to the power of M, right? So if you increase the size of your, you know, uh, beam splitter array, your interferometer, you'll be increasing the power, you know, 0 0.99 to the power of M. You increase M because you need M layers in order for all the photons to go to all the modes. So you have exponentially fewer photons surviving if you increase the size of your beam splitter array. That is a terrible thing because if you just like arbitrarily, uncontrollably, uncontrollably increase your system size, you basically have no photons left. And it turns out that it's possible for you to just simply mo model the system with you know, arbitrarily small error by approximating with you know, the vacuum state, which is to say there is nothing, uh, or you know, some kind of classical state that doesn't require quantum you know, computations or storing exponentially large quantum states. So if your loss is too high, you know, it'll be obvious to be easy to simulate uh, systems like this. So what we do here is to look at a few situations in which the loss of, you know, the photon loss doesn't actually scale exponentially. Uh, so what we look at is, you know, uh, the quantity n, which is how many photons we put in, right? Uh, because generally, you know, if you put in more photons, you probably want to increase your system size and that would give you more loss. So correspondingly, the percentage of photons that survive you know, would scale with the number of photons input, not linearly. Why? Because if you have a linear scaling, you know, you, you always have 60% of photons surviving, then that means, you know, you're not really increasing the loss. You're not increasing the number of depth of your beam splitter array. So that kind of scaling is not, you know, experimentally realistic, but that's one way to scale. You know, you have linear scaling, which is to say the surviving photon n out is proportional to an input. Or you can, you know, make it a little bit more aggressive to say, how about I don't scale perfectly? I only scale with the you know, square root of that. That's also a possibility. Or I scale with uh, you know, one over fourth power of that, of the number of input photons. So that would correspond to situations where I am not doing, I'm not doing all M layers. I'm only doing fewer layers because remember M layers will give me exponentially small surviving percentage. So I can't do all layers. So so the, the, the square root scaling of surviving photons and also the one over fourth power surviving photons uh, capture a regime where the number of layers doesn't scale linearly as the number of photons, but something else uh, that is more moderate than that. So what we do here is, you know, first theoretically prove what is the entanglement entropy? You know, again, entanglement entropy is this quantity that we mentioned earlier, right? Uh, we mentioned earlier over here. This is the entanglement entropy, which tells you how hard it is to simulate something. And that makes sense because, you know, for example, if you have high entanglement entropy, that means all the lambda values are evenly distributed. So what the what our simulation algorithm does is to say, okay, if I can compute these lambda values, and then a lot of them will be very, very small because most of it will be, you know, a few of them will be large, taking care of most of the cases, and a few, and most of them will be very, very small. So the idea for the efficient simulation algorithm is to basically throw away the smaller lambda values. But if you have high entanglement entropy, everything is evenly distributed. It's hard for you to decide how to throw things away. 
because if things are even and you throw away half of it, you're just gonna reduce half of your accuracy, right? So only in the case where the entanglement entropy is low, where you have a lot of small probability, uh, small probability lambdas, and then a few large ones, will we be able to safely throw away a lot of these values, which will make your simulation efficient. So what we do is we theoretically compute um, the, the value for the entanglement entropy. And we see that, you know, this is the, so this is the, you know, this kind of scaling with one or fourth power. We see entanglement entropy decreases as you hit a critical system size, which is roughly, you know, depends on what the beta parameter is. So our scaling would also have a constant proportionality before it. But the point is, you know, we, always, we all see kind of uh, increase and then decrease. And for square root scaling, we see something that looks like a logarithmic increase in the entanglement entropy, which highly suggests that, you know, if entanglement entropy is logarithmic, then your simulation complex is probably not exponential. So that would also allow efficient simulation. And then the linear case scaling is illustrated as the theoretical line is the, the dotted, uh, sorry, the, the, the dashed line is the theoretical estimate. It scales linearly. So that means if your entanglement entropy scales linearly, your, your cost of simulation will be exponential. And so, so here, you know, this plot is for smaller system because it's not theoretical anymore. It also shows you the experimental simulations using the tensor network algorithm that we just described. We see that our uh, simulation also shows a reduction in the entanglement entropy for the uh, one over fourth power scaling case, logarithmic increase for the square root case and linear case for the uh, constant loss case. And we can see that the theoretical prediction and the uh, experimental data agrees pretty well. Now there's always approximation using the theory. There's also approximation using the simulation. So we don't expect them to perfectly agree. Um, so quantitative, uh, you know, quantitative and qualitative uh, agreement is pretty well, pretty good in, in you know, our assessment. Uh, another thing we can look at is the so-called squeezing parameter. So remember how I said that the, you know, input photon state, you know, when you have a squeezed state, it's an infinite superposition of all the photon numbers, right? So you can adjust how many photons are there are in each mode on average by changing the probability distribution. And that is controlled by the squeezing parameter, so-called R parameter. So here, basically, this one corresponds to, on average, one photon per mode. This corresponds to two photons per mode. This one corresponds to four photons per mode. And we also simulate in the situation where the scaling is one over fourth power. So what we're seeing here is that by increasing the average photon numbers per mode, we're not drastically improving the entanglement entropy scaling. So you can see compared to the overall increase, uh, you know, due to the increasing photon number, uh, this effect of the squeezing parameter is actually pretty minimal. And also, like, it's basically not quite possible to squeeze this hard all the way to 1.44, because most studies don't even report uh, more than two photons on average per mode. So experimentally, uh, you know, achievable uh, increase using squeezing, using putting more photons per squeeze mode is not very likely. Now, so I've answered you the question, you know, for the scaling of entanglement entropy, but I kind of skipped the part where I talk about why is entanglement entropy related to the simulation complexity. Here, what I do is I explicitly calculate the bond dimension, which is exactly related to the simulation complexity, instead of just showing you the entanglement entropy, which is more of a theoretical quantity. So what is the bond dimension? You know, if we go back earlier, we see that the bond dimension, you know, are these how many values are these alpha indices, you know, these bond indices, uh, can they take on? So that, they can take on chi values all the way from zero to chi minus one. And as I told you, you know, increasing the chi gives you more capacity of representing, you know, a larger tensor. So that would tune the accuracy. So this chi is called the, uh, the bond dimension. And, and also, you know, this not only tells you the storage cost, because what we said was, you know, the, the, the storage cost is in chi, right? But also for the computational part, we also see that you know you have to sum over chi indices and also you have to calculate the theta tensors which also have to loop over two chi indices uh, uh, sorry two alpha indices so the bond dimension will tell you the computational complexity as well as the memory complexity but you know to polynomial order right so on the exponential scale we plot the scaling of the bond dimension with respect to system sizes or so once again we have the linear scaling the square root scaling and one or fourth power scaling. Uh, 
and we see that we have an exponential increase in the bond dimension for a linear scaling case, which you know on the exponent on the log plot this will look like a straight line. And then we see this one for the uh, square root scaling is not exponential because it's not a straight line anymore; it's slightly curved. Now the limitation is you know you can see, okay, we can only simulate to systems of size twelve, where earlier plots you can see that. You know, 12 is basically here. So you're really not able to see much of the plateau. Uh, and theoretically, we can predict, you know, much better for larger system sizes all the way up to 1,000. You can more clearly see this logarithmic scaling. So for the limited range we're able to plot, we have, you know, kind of already observing that this is not exponential. And then for the one or fourth power scaling, you know, it's a little bit more clear that it's not exponential scaling. And we also similarly show you that by increasing the bond dimension, we can increase the simulation accuracy. So this y-axis is basically the simulation error. You know, it's one minus the trace of the density matrix that we are modeling. Now, it's impossible for us to compute the fidelity between the perfect quantum state and our simulated quantum state. Why? Because, you know, if we are able to obtain the perfect desired quantum state, we, we don't need to do this simulation, right? So we won't be able to do the fidelity comparison exactly so what we do is use this proxy to basically calculate the, the trace. So now you, you know that density matrices should preserve the total probability, right? So the trace should always be one. So if you, you know, start to do your approximation by cutting out these, you know, you're essentially cutting out these lambda values, you lose the probability, right? So this tells you, so the, the, lose, the loss of probability, the loss of your trace value will tell you how much the truncation of the, Lambda values have in, impacted on your simulation accuracy. So this is a proxy, but a pretty good proxy. And we can show that for three different set of uh, you know experimental configurations, increasing the bond dimension exponentially. So yeah, we're 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 doubling the, the bond dimension. You know each data point. We can see exponentially increasing the bond dimension exponentially decreases the error. So you know there's a direct relationship between bond dimension and simulation error. So overall, this kind of conclusion is that, um, you know, is that entanglement entropy scaling is at most logarithmic when output photon is square root of input photon number. So this is telling us that efficient simulation when loss is higher uh, for, you know, all different input photon types is possible because we have evidence to say that when logarithmic scaling for entanglement entropy is present, we're going to have efficient simulation because the bond dimension doesn't grow exponentially. So if any experiment you, you will build in the future scales worse than this, then you're gonna be, then the classical simulation will be efficient. Then, you know, you won't be able to get quantum advantage in the most rigorous sense. Um, now we have a, a few caveats, meaning that, you know, the, the, the polynomial order is still pretty large, right? Uh, it actually turns out to be, I think, uh, cubic to, to the bond dimension. Uh, so, you know, for classical computing, you know, cubic complexity reduction is not insignificant at all. Um, and also, our simulation algorithm cannot simulate the current experiments carried out by Xanadu or, uh, yeah, their experiment is already too hard to simulate. But what, what our study is to say, that when they scale up, things will get worse. Uh, or Or to say, you know, at least you know, at least you won't be able to expect an exponentially harder simulation if you scale the quantum experiments up. You only expect expect a, 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 a polynomial advantage. So future work uh, may involve generalizing to more exotic tensor networks that like the two-dimensional tensors that I showed earlier. These are called the projected entanglement pair states. Yeah, the advantage of that is we'll be able to then simulate higher dimensional systems. So for example, Xanadu's uh, the boson sampling experiment is done on a three-dimensional array, uh, a three-dimensional tensor state. So we could, uh, you know, generalize our simulations to be able to capture that case. We can also directly apply our U1 symmetric algorithm to quantum walks, ground state estimation, and time dynamics of 1D Hamiltonians. Now, for all of these, they have U1 symmetry, and the U1 symmetry matters because our algorithm is kind of the first push to run U1 symmetric simulations on GPUs. Quantum walk has U1 symmetry because it similarly preserves the particle numbers like photons. Ground state estimation, time dynamic Hamiltonians, if you want to use the U1 symmetry, you have to ensure that your Hamiltonian has U1 symmetry. And that is usually in the case when the total spin number is preserved. For example, if you have Ising models, 
you want to make sure your Hamiltonian preserves the total uh, or your time dynamics preserve the total uh, spin and not kind of have a dissipative uh, increase or, or decrease of the total spin. So in those cases, our algorithm can also effectively simulate 1D systems. Uh, yeah, so that is our uh, study. Uh, we use uh, supercomputing and also graphical accelerators to answer questions of fundamental physics and also uh, quantum information science uh, concerns. So if you if anybody is interested in the code, it's you know publicly available at the GitHub repository. And I would like to acknowledge that this research was supported by and used the resources of Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, which is a, a U.S. Department of Energy Office of Science user facility. Uh, yeah, thank you for your time and uh, I'm ready for any questions if we have some.